Welcome everyone uh, to our webinar today. I am Pat Soldano. I am president of Family Enterprise USA. We promote generationally owned family businesses and their lifetimes of savings at a national level in Washington, DC. We represent all families of all sizes and all industries. We recently helped Congress form a Congressional Family Business Caucus, so you can truly have a voice in Washington, DC. And we hope you'll support us in that effort. I am very pleased today to have with us Pombrich Berg. Uh, the webinar that we are presenting today, as you can see on the screen, is it's all relative family matters in succession business, in family business succession. And I'm very pleased to have with me today Thomas Carroll. Thomas Carroll and I have worked together in the past. I'm so thrilled to have him on this webinar. I can attribute that he has excellent skills and talents in the wealth management field since we did have a close working relationship. But Thomas is principal and president of Hamrichburg. Um, he is part of the executive management team for the firm and leads a number of growth and client service initiatives. He has extensive background, as I've already alluded to, in the wealth management field as both an advisor to clients and a leader of client service organizations. He has joined on this webinar today by Abby Fahm, who's Managing Director, Family Wealth Specialist at Hamrichburg, who is serving or sharing her insights on the parallel experiences of planning for your family and your business and the do's and don'ts regarding business succession. I'm gonna turn it over to Thomas now, who's going to further introduce the firm as well as formally introduce Abby. So Thomas, it's all yours. Pat, thank you very much. I appreciate that, that warm introduction. It was um, obviously a, a pleasure to work for you for the number of years that we did. And now in my role as, as president of Hamrick Berg, I am, um, it's, it's just great to be a supporter of, of, of Family Enterprise USA. Um, you know, spent a lot of time with, um, with Pat and really trying to understand the importance of um, family businesses across our country and how important family business is to our economy. Um, and so we were proud to support um, the Family Enterprise USA effort and the mission of, of creating and sustaining uh, and growing family businesses and, and, and advocating on your behalf in Congress, which I was able to do uh, with, with Pat and a team uh, last fall, which was a, which was a pleasure to, to do that. So we're happy to be part of this and happy to bring you this content today. So for those of you who have not heard of our firm, Hamrick Berg, or HB, if it's if you prefer, uh, is an independent uh, fee-only uh, wealth management uh, registered investment advisor firm. Uh, we were started by David Hamrick and Andy Berg in 1989, a true kind of American success story, entrepreneurial business, started with a $100,000 loan from Andy Berg's father. Uh, and fast forward 34 years later, uh, we are advising on over $13 billion of assets uh, across um, you know, approximately 3,000 client families, uh, over 45 states around the country. So, so we are truly a, a national uh, player and advisor for, for families. And um, you know, the, the, a lot of that success, honestly, is built upon our approach to service. Uh, we believe that service is the most important thing that we do. So we provide deep technical experts uh, to address all matters that, that a family faces. Um, and a large part of that success uh, that we've had over the last 34 years is the work that we do uh, in our family office, really helping families uh, sustain wealth across multiple generations. And a key part of that uh, is the advice that we provide uh, uh, through the next person I'm about to introduce, uh, Abby Flaum. Uh, and I am pleased to uh, introduce Abby. Abby joined our firm about six months ago after a incredible 17-year career as an estate planning attorney. Uh, I was able to twist her arm enough to get her to leave the practice of law uh, to to join a very successful law practice, I might say, to to join us at, at HB. Uh, she left uh, Atlanta's largest estate planning practice. Uh, and her practice focused on estate, uh, gift and, and charitable planning, probate, 
uh, trust in a state administration, pre and post marital planning, and of most relevant and importance uh, for today, business business succession planning. Uh, so she covered a lot of ground in her legal career, and now she gets to focus on working and serving uh, our clients at, at Hamrickburg as, as a managing director and, and family wealth strategist. So in her role here at our firm, she provides you know, clients with you know, high-end, personalized uh, guidance on tax-efficient um, wealth business and estate planning strategies. Um, and today, she's here to share her experience uh, and expertise related to the all-employment interplay between success and planning and family dynamics, which I imagine many on the call are um, dealing with um, every day. So with that introduction, I would love to turn the uh, rest of the hour that we have together over to Abby and ask her to walk us through the materials that you have today. So Abby, turn it over to you. All right. Thanks so much, Thomas. I appreciate it. Um, and thank you all for having us today. We're happy to be here. I've been so glad ever since the world sort of opened back up again to be out in the world speaking to live audiences. But if there's one thing I can count on with a Zoom audience, it's that I know that you all are sitting there in formal clothes, not pajamas, with no windows open on your computer, attentively paying attention to everything that I'm saying, and laughing at all of my terrible jokes. So I appreciate that very much, and I'm so glad to be here. Um, but if you are here, it means you have an interest in family businesses in one way or another. Maybe you have a family business. Maybe you started one. Maybe you're a member of a family that has a family business and you're doing your due diligence and taking the steps that need to be taken for you to be effectively involved in that business one day. Maybe you sit in an advisory capacity with regard to a family business and you know that family dynamics are something that come up on a daily basis, so you're tuning in. As Thomas said, at Homerick Berg, we work with many, many business owners on all aspects of their financial life. And we work with lots of families and are constantly dealing with family dynamics and working to promote harmony and prevent friction. I'll say those words a lot because I generally say them a lot. But as Thomas said, just six months ago, I sat in a different advisory role. So prior to joining Hamrick Berg, as Thomas mentioned, I was an estate planning attorney here in Atlanta for almost 17 years. Now, oftentimes clients would come in to me at first to discuss their wills and various trusts, right? Oftentimes it was because they were about to board a flight to Africa for a safari and it occurred to them, oh yeah, I need to get my will taken care of. But generally, um, whatever brought them in the door, they would be focused on the things that people tend to focus on when transitioning wealth from one generation to the next. Who should receive the house? How should the accounts pass? How should it be structured? How should the trusts work? Are there trusts? Who are the trustees? And they wanted to focus on all of these critical, critical aspects of their estate plan. What I would have to work hard to impress on business owners, including family business owners, is that family business succession planning is a critical part of the overall estate plan. Because when you think about it, what is estate planning? It's not passing a jar of Grey Poupon from one Rolls Royce to the next. An estate is just all of your stuff, all of the assets that you have worked to acquire during your lifetime. And of course, that includes any interest you have in the family business. So I would try to impress upon business owners that just as it's important to ensure that your house passes to the child you want it to pass to, and that the dogs don't wind up living with Cruella de Vil, also, it is important to ensure that the business doesn't wind up in the wrong hands and that it's going to be managed properly, not mismanaged in the future. Why wouldn't you devote the same care and consideration to the succession planning of your business as you would for the succession planning for the rest of your estate for your family? Because after all, 
Having a business and a family are in many ways very par parallel experiences. So I am 1000% shameless. And I'll tell you, before I had children, when people would offer me unsolicited photos of their children and talk incessantly about their kids, I would roll my eyes and think how obnoxious it was that I was just being bombarded with all of this kid stuff. And here I am nine years later and you are getting an unsolicited photo of my children, their first professional photo taken together when my daughter, who's about to be seven years old, was just seven days old. This is where you sigh and say how beautiful and cute they are. I can hear it coming. Um, but I actually have a reason for working this photo of my two beauties into this presentation. When I was pregnant with these kids and I was planning for them, I did all of the things that you're supposed to do when you're planning for a family. I regularly went to my OB. Because at the time I was pregnant, I was considered a geriatric maternity patient. It was their term that they used openly with me. I also went to a perinatologist weekly. I traded in Coke Zeros and coffee for water, which was the absolute worst. And I only ate organic. Uh, whereas now if my kids eat a grilled cheese and a chocolate milk, I'm grateful they got some protein in their bodies. I went for walks every day. I took prenatal vitamins. I researched cribs and how some of them off put gases and you know, planned for baby gates and all those kinds of things that you're supposed to do. And since the day that these children were born, I have been doing everything in my power to ensure that they are happy, healthy, and generally on a solid path in life. So of course I bug them to do their homework and to practice the cello. I encourage them to be kind to others. I take them for their vaccines. I nudge them about eating their meals. That one's hard. I'm the parent that sits front row center at the orchestra recitals. And I'm the one that sits down and talks to my children about obstacles, big or small, and how they might have approached the management of those obstacles differently. I'm a concerned and involved parent, and maybe a little annoying, admittedly, but these two children are the best thing I ever did in my life. And I look at it as my role to do everything I can to ensure that they continue to be the wonderful humans that they are, and that one day when they're no longer under my roof and they go off into the world, I have given them all of the tools they need to succeed in the world on their own. Well, the same is true for business owners. I've had hundreds of clients who have poured their blood, sweat, and tears into the establishment of family businesses. And just like I gave up my Diet Cokes and took prenatal vitamins, they did everything they were supposed to do in establishing their businesses. They met with the relevant consultants, performed market research, worked hard to establish business plans, and, and did everything that they were supposed to do in the development of their business, purchasing life insurance, establishing funding, working to scale the business and so forth. Now, once you've gone through all of that hard work and the business is a going entity, it's important to do all you can, of course, as my clients have done, to foster the growth and development of that thriving business uh, into a well-respected enterprise. Now, they may experience blunders and successes, and hopefully they learn from these blunders and successes to make the uh, business even more successful. They become so focused though on this business, their other baby, that oftentimes it takes someone like I was sitting in the lawyer chair to force them to focus on the time when they will have to relinquish control over this baby and send it off into the world with all of the tools that it needs to thrive on its own. Yeah, I told you there was a way I could connect those children into this. So once clients have been on board with the idea of planning for business succession, they often want to jump right into the logistics, you know, how the finances are managed and how the assets are handled, all of those various things that the lawyer, me sitting in that role, you know, is hired to do. 
Now, I will never ever discount the importance of having qualified legal counsel working with you to ensure that the appropriate legal documents are in place that represent your wishes and properly are designed to transition the business. But I will tell you that both documents and planning that appropriately manage family dynamics so as to prevent friction and foster harmony within the family, those are just as important, arguably more important. You can't put the cart before the horse. Again, my kids, right now I am planning a sleepover birthday party for my little girl who's about to be seven. Now, I know the logistics of this party. I know what time the party is called for. I know that I will have little girls show up and do each other's hair and probably put enough makeup on each other to make a circus clown jealous. I know that we will watch a movie that I'll have to carefully select so as not to scare any of my guests or upset their parents. There will be popcorn and cake and cookies and they'll likely stay up too late, which is why I will have them picked up immediately after breakfast the next day so I am not stuck in the house with a bunch of over-sugared, tired seven-year-old girls. All important in the logistics of the planning. Okay, but perhaps more important and actually how the party will go down is the guest list itself and the dynamics of the girls. For example, if you're a, if you're a mother of a girl, especially, this may be applicable with boys, but with girls, if you're going to have an odd number of guests, you are more likely to have one girl singled out. Okay, so you need to ensure that there's someone there to sort of buddy up with each child and think about their various personalities. I know there's one girl that doesn't go to the same elementary school as the rest of the girls. So I need to be sure there's a kind soul there who's welcoming and will make her feel included. There's no way that I'm inviting the kid who publicly talks back to her parents because I know how she's gonna behave in my house and that is not okay. For the girl who's at my house on an almost daily basis and thinks she owns the joint, I have to be sure that she is not bossing the other children around. And so I really need to be sure that I am thinking about all of these various personalities because the end goal for all of this is that my daughter has a happy birthday and she's smiling from ear to ear. But I need to ensure that in planning for the logistics of this party, I am balancing all of the personalities. And the same is true with business succession planning. And I'm here to tell you, having worked with hundreds or maybe thousands of families, that many families are wonderful and communicate and get along with each other. But many families have at least one family member who at the end of the day is just a seven-year-old girl at a birthday party. So when the world of parenting a child and a business collide, uh, oftentimes the strengths and weaknesses of both the family and the business have a way of showing their true colors. Now, of course, the legal transition documents are important, as I mentioned, but so too is the internal side of the family transition. And there are a few things that a family should really be focusing on when planning for peace in succession. One, is whether or not there's the right choice for sort of the next family member to lead the family, the right person to be the heir apparent. And in a lot of families there are, but it's not always for the same reason. Sometimes it's because a child has really shown dedication and commitment to the family business and um, they've really earned it. You know, they're being placed in that role because of merit and the family wants it and they want it. And it's a win, 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 win. Sometimes the heir apparent is chosen because they're the firstborn child or the firstborn male or the firstborn female or, or whatever the case may be. I would offer to you that in talks, whether it's with your family, your lawyer, whoever's helping you to plan, it's important to acknowledge whatever the reason is for choosing the heir apparent so that there isn't any 
miscommunication or misunderstanding in the future, which can lead to fighting amongst family members. It's sort of important for everyone to realize how things are planned. I think it's also important to acknowledge the condition of the family. Is everyone sitting around a campfire making s'mores, holding hands and singing kumbaya? Or are they plotting for one another's demise? Oftentimes it's sort of something in between. Um, and that's important as sort of the head of the business and family to keep in mind. Um, a lot of people sort of try to just wish this away, but you can't just wish it away. And so when you're thinking about succession planning and what should go into the various documents, I think you have to accept whatever the reality is for the family at the moment, hoping that if it does change in the future, you can change the documents then. Now, it's not always apparent, but sometimes it's very apparent to the business leaders of the older generation why the younger generation may want to be involved. Sometimes it's because they truly care about the business and the success and the family legacy. And they want to do everything they can to be involved in the future success and growth of both the family and the business. And that's wonderful and ideal. Sometimes the next generation is acting out of some sort of self-interest and greed. There's tons of TV shows and movies about this. I promised myself I wouldn't talk about the show Succession, but you should watch it. It's good and totally relevant. Um, Knives Out, there's all these movies because this is the stuff that sells movies and TV related to estate planning. Um, but really, there usually are, there, well, I should say there's usually at least one member of the family that um, isn't always interested in the promotion or uh, the harmony. So it's important to keep this in mind. Do spouses, in-laws, friends try to exert their influence in an unwelcome way? And who is susceptible to that influence? Another thing that you kind of want to sweep under the rug is a human, but as a person who's planning for the succession of your business, you really need to sort of confront that issue, at least in your mind with your legal counsel, so that you can address it properly. If someone is easily influenced by someone that is constantly offering them advice, especially wrong advice, you'll need to keep that in mind so that perhaps you keep them out of um, positions where they would be making decisions on behalf of the business. Now, if they're receiving great advice and if those spouses and in-laws and friends are giving welcome advice, that's another thing to consider as well. Importantly, I would consider whether any family members are harboring any unaddressed, unresolved resentment between one another. I had a legal case once where my client's sister was suing him. Now he was serving as a fiduciary in their dad's estate and she had all kinds of legal grounds for why she was suing him. But the truth of the matter was, dad had given our client a family heirloom when the kids were young and she never got over it and was just looking for reasons to fight with him. That sort of thing can exist in many families. And if it exists in yours, uh, or in the family that you advise, it's important to try to address that now, whether addressing it means talking about it within the family or structuring the business succession so as to avoid any conflicts that can arise as a result of that resentment. Similarly, are there any feelings of entitlement? If a child or someone from a next generation feels entitled that is not going to be a good ingredient in the succession planning soup. So um, if that entitlement can be unwound in some way, it's, it's an issue to really confront in, a, in thinking about how best for the business to pass on. Answering all of these questions is really critical in examining the ultimate question, which is how do we preserve peace in the transition of the business to the next generation to ensure that both the business and the family prosper. Well, I would argue to you that 
defining your focus on your family can really help in that capacity. When I was growing up, by the way, I'm from New York, I'm a woman, I'm chatty. So the stories are my best way of relating. When I was growing up, my best friend, Matt Supsack, lived right up the block from me. And I would ride my bike to his house every day. And we would do our homework. Um, but we would also, once Nintendo came out, we would just play Nintendo until we were blue in the face. And we ate so many sugary treats that we would become nauseated. And then we'd stay up later probably than we were supposed to and watch Miami Vice, which we knew parents didn't really want kids our age watching. But why were we able to do this? Well, my parents were never home and Matt's parents were never home either. We were the definition of the Generation X latchkey kids that were raising ourselves. Matt's parents were gone before he woke up in the morning and they came home even after we were done watching Miami Vice at night. They were constantly focused on their business. They were not involved in Matt's homework. They did not come to his soccer games. They were not there for parent-teacher conferences. They had a pool business. And initially, the pool business was the game in town. In the town we grew up in, which was a suburb just outside New York, um, they were the pool business that everybody turned to. And with work and with time, they became the business in the county. And it's a pretty successful, large county. And that was a great thing for their business. And then they really became the pool business, mostly for the state of New York. If you had a pool, you were probably calling these people at some point in time. They were working really hard and they were really devoted to that business. And did my friend Matt think they did not love him? Absolutely not. He knew they loved him. You know, they would check in with him. They'd call him. He felt their love. And from their perspective, working in the business in this way was their love language. They wanted to build up this business to one day pass on to my friend, Matt. And they also felt that providing for him and his two brothers financially was a way to show their love. The problem was that one day we grew up and they came to Matt and they said that they wanted him to be involved in the business. Now, Matt never knew anything about the business. They never sat down at the dinner table and talked about what their day was like. All he knew about this pool business was that it was a pool business and that it took his parents away from him all the time growing up. And he didn't want that. So when his parents came to him and said, Matt, we'd like for you to be involved in the business, he politely declined, as did his brothers. None of the kids wound up getting involved in the business. And actually, his parents did not engage in any succession planning at all. And once they passed, um, Matt and his brothers wound up, you know, sort of scrambling to try to sell the business to a buyer. It's an unfortunate set of circumstances. Now, I am not suggesting to you that if you do not include your children in your business during their formative years, you don't have a prayer of getting them involved in the business later on. But if it's one's desire to have the children involved in the business, it's important to let them know about business matters, at least at a very high level. Hey guys, guess what happened at work today? Or a funny thing happened when I um, went to talk to these people about their pool. When the children are young, you can be involved in shaping who they are, and you can also involve them in the business in some way, shape, or form. I think when those things happen, the children may hold more of an interest in getting involved in the business, and you have an interest in shaping who they are and how that involvement will look. So there's some examples of this. One is Gucci family. And I think there was a movie about this as well, because family scandal is always great to watch in the theaters. But Gucci o Gucci started a small leather shop in the early 1900s, and he really became known for putting together really quality goods. Well, ultimately, two of his sons got involved in the business, uh, both in leather making 
and in uh, marketing of the business. Well, he did not engage in any business succession planning. And yes, even in the early 1900s, succession planning was a thing, maybe not as formally uh, as we do it today, but he did not engage in succession planning. And what happened was that when Gucci Oguchi died, he left the business to his two sons equally under the terms of his will. There were no documents in place for the management. He had not devoted any time, money, effort, consideration to how his sons interacted with one another, how they would feel about the business, how they would manage the business together. He just left it to them. And because of a lack of communication between them, some significant greed going on within the family, feelings of entitlement and sibling rivalry, the Gucci family was ultimately ousted from the business by private equity. And today, Gucci, which is a total fashion powerhouse, is owned by private equity, and there are no members of the Gucci family involved in the business. Now, just to give you an example, and that's a positive example, just think about this. On a Sunday, maybe you've gone to church or maybe Costco, you've run around, you've done your errands, and if you're like me at one or two o'clock, you start to really have a hankering for a chicken sandwich. Well, inevitably it always happens on a Sunday, which is why I bring it up. It's just, just, just how it goes. Um, but I bring up the Chick-fil-A slide here because Chick-fil-A was started by Truett Cathy here in Georgia as a family business. And his family worked with him to help to grow Chick-fil-A into the multi-billion dollar enterprise that it is today. And a tenet of the Chick-fil-A company policy is a focus on family and community. The Kathy family always seems to attribute the success of the business to the success of their family is working together as a cohesive unit and really um, acting in harmony with one another. As a result of the company's focus and dedication on being better, better people, better employers, providing a better product, and providing better service, it has grown to be one of the largest and most successful restaurant chains in all of the United States. And again, this is attributed to the focus on family first. So, if one accepts the idea that focusing on the family may help to develop revenue generation as a nice byproduct, then maintenance of the family relationships is something that we have to really decide to devote time, money, and effort to. And there are several aspects of that. One of them would be the development of a family mission statement. Um, and this is a statement that's going to be for the family, but the thought is to run the business in line with the family mission statement. Now, more on that in just a little bit. Each family member really needs the latitude to determine who he or she is, what their strengths and weaknesses are, what their skill set is. And the family sort of has to come to realize that too, because if someone is being assessed both by themselves and by the family, as to whether or not they're going to be a good contributor to the family business, we sort of have to know who they are. So if a child, for example, is an extreme introvert, you probably don't want to send them out on the sales floor. Although I am not a salesperson, so you salespeople out there might say that's just the way to get them comfortable. But you get my point, and that is the example. Or if, if a grandchild has substance abuse issues and your family owns a successful line of bar and grills, if they're going to be involved in the business, maybe they need to be involved in sort of the back office part of the business. Similarly, in sort of figuring out who fits where, I would say setting benchmarks for younger generations is really important. Benchmarks can really serve to educate a younger generation about expectations for them. Um, and it can also help them to prove themselves both to themselves and 
to the older generations of the family, the people running the business. Um, it really allows them to see what's expected of them. It allows them to sort of realize their own abilities. And I think it gives people in the generation that are in control, perhaps peace in seeing firsthand how someone functions in the business setting. So if the family, for example, owns a retail store, maybe a member of the younger generation who's looking to get involved spends a period of time in the back unboxing inventory or dusting the inventory or even cleaning the bathroom. And I don't know what the right period of time to do that is. Maybe it's six months or a year until you give them sort of another task, which would be moving up to the register, interacting with customers, ultimately helping with paperwork. All those kinds of things are good benchmarks for everyone to sort of see what younger generations capabilities are. Now, if there is a family member that really should not be involved in the business, it won't be good for the business, it won't be good for the family member. It's the kind of topic you don't want to address, you sort of want to sweep it under the rug. But I would tell you that tiptoeing around the topic isn't doing anyone any favors. When it comes to the family business, you want to be sure that you have a good succession plan in place and everyone's sort of on the same page with regard to that succession plan. And when it comes to the family member that shouldn't be involved in the business, well, they might be hanging their hat on the fact that they're going to be involved in the family business one day. And if you don't tell them that that's not a realistic expectation, you are wasting time. They could be spending actually planning for what might be a valid part of their future. So that's something that you really need to confront if you're going to do some uh, successful succession planning. Um, every member of the family who's going to be involved in the business needs to understand the inner workings of the business in some way, shape, or form. Now, if you own a burger joint, I think that if you're going to be in management one day, you probably have to understand everything from cleaning the grease out of the fryer to you know, how the books are done for the business and everything in between. I know to use the Kathy family for another example, I know that in Chick-fil-A, you don't get into management unless you fried fries and, you know, flip some nuggets. So I guess you don't flip nuggets, you flip burgers. But regardless, um, it's important to know all of the inner workings of the business. Lastly, I'll offer to you that when examining all of these things, sometimes it's hard to realize these things about your own family, or sometimes it's hard to have the necessary discussions about these different aspects with your own family. And so it may be worthwhile to bring in advisors, mediators, therapists, professionals that you can engage to help facilitate these conversations and move them forward within your family. Now, if you, oh, I have to flip the slide here. If you understand that family first is the right sort of view for your family and for your business, then um, just as a succession plan is an absolute necessity for the proper transition of the business, I would say the family meeting is absolutely vital to maintaining a cohesive family unit, which we hope in turn fosters the emergence and growth of a successful family business. The relationships of supportive and functioning families, like any strong relationship in life, requires intentionality. Family meetings should start early, even before younger generations are really involved in the business, and be held often enough to keep family members regularly engaged with one another uh, and clued in to business matters to the extent appropriate. These meetings don't have to and really probably shouldn't include every member of the family all the time. They should always include what I would call a core group, and you know who the core group is for your business, but they should involve a core group of people and every now and then be extended to include the larger family, including those who are even just tangentially involved with the business or hope to be. The purpose of these meetings is really to devote the work necessary to maintain the family as a well-functioning unit. 
And if certain members of younger generations will one day be involved in the business, involving them in these meetings could really translate into positive results for the business itself. Now, certainly, business should be discussed on some level in these meetings. But for the family as a whole and individual family members, important topics may include achievements. Now, this could be achievements in business. It could be personal achievements. Did someone score a goal at the soccer game or did someone land a big new client? Sharing achievements with your family is great for bonding purposes, getting to know one another better, and really just celebrating, which is important for a family. On the flip side, we have conflicts and challenges. Was someone bullied on the playground today? Or did someone confront a difficult uh, task at work that was really hard to overcome? The family would be a place or the right audience to run this by to talk about how you could have confronted those conflicts differently, how we could have gone over it better so that the next time we can improve. I have this down as two separate bullets, but I really think morals and value and culture and identity sort of go hand in hand. What's going on within the family and who are you as a family? This is really important to establish if you're going to be a cohesive unit. What do you all tend to believe in? I'm not saying you have to tell everyone what to believe in, but a family often tends to share certain morals and values, and it's important to discuss those at the family meetings. Finances are an important item of discussion that might be just among what I would call that core group of involved family members in the business. But ultimately, as you bring younger generations in, it's important for them, even if they're really not going to be involved in the financial end, to have some sort of an idea of how the business of the business works and what the goals are, a discussion of goals. Should these be our goals? How should they change? How can we achieve them? Working together at these family meetings to discuss these things um, can really be beneficial to the family as a whole and keep them united in deciding how to proceed to achieve their goals. Now, this list is by no means exhaustive, but the whole point here is that the family meeting is the appropriate venue for the family members to seek guidance or resolution about anything really on their minds from their family their team, okay? Now we have an ever developing, sorry, tangible product of family meetings is what I mentioned earlier, the family mission statement. And this is an explanation of who the family is, what its general beliefs are and sort of governing principles for the family. Now the mission statement may serve as a guidepost for the family, um, to deepen the intra-family connection by providing a common sense of purpose. Taking the mission statement one step further, a family constitution is critical for a family that is serious about their familial business relationships. It's a document that sort of provides rules and protocol that are in line with the family's mission statement and establishes goals and processes for making decisions in line with the family. An example I can give you from practice relating to all of this has to do with um, clients who have called me to share the great news that one of their kids is engaged. Um, I've had so many clients over the years with family businesses. And of course, you know, we all hope that they're happy and they like the soon to be in law. But we also want to ensure that the family business is protected and so prenuptial agreements inevitably come up in conversation. And I know that when I say those words to hear to you today over the computer, I mean, those words just strike fear into the hearts of many. But I can tell you that for the families that I have worked with who have family meetings, who have family mission statements, who have a family constitution, who sort of know who their family is, it has generally wound up being a non-issue because their kids grew up thinking about who they might marry one day and what the wedding would look like. But they also knew from a time they were young that when they got older, if they were going to get married, a prenuptial agreement was just part of the process. 
It was just something that was going to happen. And as they got into serious relationships with their boyfriend or girlfriend, it would inevitably come up in the discussion of how many kids do you want? And oh, by the way, if I get married, my family's going to expect a prenuptial agreement. So having these kinds of discussions is not only good for family cohesiveness, but it really just sort of keeps everybody on the same page. And I'll say that, you know, a family constitution or a mission statement can be an excellent product of a family meeting, but also that the discussion and the debate and the reflection and examination and time and effort that goes into being together uh, in order to come up with the constitution and the mission statement may produce something that is more enduring for the family than the actual constitution and or mission statement itself. Now, in order to have productive family meetings, I have just a few tips for you from a very high level. One would be to choose a leader, and this should be someone who's both well-organized and a member of the family that everyone respects. You don't want the person who's in charge to be the same person that everybody sort of rolls their eyes at. Um, so choosing a leader can help to keep everyone on task make a plan for a meeting. Just like if you go in for a business meeting, it's good to have an agenda. It's good to keep everyone on task. And a nice touch might be to ask family members in advance about topics they might want to see on an agenda, um, letting them know if you think you'll have time to address it in this meeting or another one, but letting them know also that their thoughts are important. Including everyone is important. Like I said, a family meeting is a place to uh, not only talk, but be heard. Um, now, this is not to say that you should let Cousin Eddie go on for 45 minutes about, you know, antique clocks, okay? This is probably not the venue. Talk to Cousin Eddie about antique clocks and another place, but we do want everybody to have an opportunity to be heard about the successes and the failures and the achievements and the goals and all of those kinds of things we just mentioned earlier. And we want them to feel that not only did the other family members listen to them, but they really heard them. Taking notes is a good plan. And something nice you can do is maybe delegate that job to a younger member of the family, someone in the next generation, to have them feel involved and important. And those notes might ultimately serve to help and the creation of a mission statement or family constitution later on. Um, and then lastly, as I sort of mentioned earlier, bring in professionals, whether it's your financial advisors, your estate planners, therapists, whoever it is that you think may help to provide structured focus and clarity in your family meetings. And so ultimately what I'm gonna offer to you is don't bury your head in the sand. Often founders and business leaders are so devoted to the everyday matters of the business that they don't spend considerable time thinking about these things that have all sort of floated through their mind from one time to another or about a formal succession plan. Their hearts are not necessarily set on moving to the beach or playing golf every day. A lot of these business owners are focused on the business and they feel that they need to want to stay involved forever. Unfortunately, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but forever is not possible. And if business leaders decide and um, desire to avoid an unexpected fire drill to arrange the succession during a crisis, much like that so shows succession I mentioned earlier, they have to devote the work to both the business and the family in helping them to achieve an optimized, well thought out structured transition. So that's really all I have to offer today with regard to dynamics and the family. And if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thanks so much, Abby. Uh, so I wanna remind everybody that if you have any questions, please put them in the chat um, and we will, we will get them there. Uh, and I'm happy to ask those of Abby. In the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and ask you some questions um, that I thought of as well. But I want to mention that Abby wrote an excellent white paper that's actually posted on Family Enterprise USA's website. I'm sure it's on HB's website as well. And it's called Parenting and Running a Business Are, in Many Ways, Parallel Experiences. 
I really encourage you to, to read that white paper. It reinforces and supports what you just presented on this webinar. So it's excellent. Um, so Abby, my first question to you revolves around the timeline for planning your succession of a family business. Can you give us a sense of kind of when do you start and what does the timeline look like? From the beginning, uh, it's, it, I think an important part of planning to establish your business is planning a timeline for the business. And so that may be more general in the beginning. It may be part of the business plan initially, but as the business becomes a growing enterprise, um, it is time to do planning for succession so that you're not rushing to do it um, during uh, an awkward for, sort of forced time in the future. It's much like when clients would come in to prepare a will, really, when, does everyone in the world need a will? No, but when you have any assets, any, any assets that you really care about, then you do need a will. And the same is true for business succession planning. So how about um, most family businesses, when they're doing this, pl this planning, there's always kind of a common pain point, right? So maybe you could tell us a little bit about what do you find is one of those most common pain points? Often it tends to be, I mean, there's so many, um, and I would say dynamics of the family as a whole uh, can be the big pain point, um, but often there's more than one member of the next generation that feels that they should be the person that's in charge as the business is transitioned and sort of working through those dynamics and ultimately making decisions and confronting some of the things that I mentioned earlier about who should and should not be involved in the business and in what capacity. Um, that's incredibly important and then, but really a pain point for so many families. Well, so I hope this isn't going to be throw you a curve here, but taking off from that comment, um, what we find often in family businesses is, especially when they're multi-generational, which so many are, is the, there's a family member or one or two that really have not had an interest in the business. They don't participate in the business, but they're owners, right? And so they feel entitled. They feel like they have a right to income or they have some they want some wealth distribution from this fantastic asset that they, they're aware of. Uh, and so they can be very disruptive to a family business and the operations of the business in a daily sense, but also you know, planning for the succession. So do you have any advice for family members is how do you deal for family owners? How do you deal with those family members that really don't work in the business, but they want their financial rewards from the business? Well, I'll say I've had many clients who have had situations like that, where despite the fact that the kids weren't involved in the business, um, the founders did want them to receive some financial benefit ultimately, and, and that can be structured. But in a case where that's really not the desire, uh, you know, I think I'm going to make everyone watching this cringe when I say this, but you have to call a spade a spade. And I feel that at the very latest, at the time when the business owners have put a succession plan or or at least most of the broad strokes of the succession plan in place, then it's time to have a family meeting and really explain what's going to be what, who's going to be involved, who's not going to be. Because what I've seen time after time is that when it's not confronted at a time when it's appropriate, there winds up being significant fighting and even lit litigation down the, down the line. I think that's excellent advice. Um, so Lauren just shared with me um, that there was someone that put this question when they registered. Uh, and that is, and he's put it in the chat for us, what are the effective strategies for the engagement of next gen when they are part owners, but are reluctant to become involved as future leaders. And I think you just addressed that a little bit, but but maybe you could be more specific about the next gen. Well, I, there's a few parts of that question, but I think a really key part of that question is that they wanna be involved, but they don't necessarily want to be future leaders. And actually that's really important because sort of like we were just talking about with your last question, there is not necessarily a place for everyone to be a leader in an organization. There need to be people that are doing a variety of different jobs for a family business. 
And so, um, you know, if that makes sense for a family member, I think that that's something to be embraced and promoted and um, praise them for really. If though they're a family member that maybe the older generation is expecting to see leadership out of, you know, I think there's a few ways to handle it. One is talking to them and seeing where the conversation goes and where their hesitancy lies. One is sort of giving it time, but every family is really different. And I think the answer to this really depends on the family itself. Um, yeah, that's all I can offer there. Well, that's very helpful. Um, so I see Noah has put a really good question into the chat. Any advice if your succession plan is to bring in someone outside the family to run the family business? So I assume that means a non-family member, right? How to integrate them, how to get the family on board. That, that's a big challenge. I think it is a big challenge. I've seen it happen a lot, though, when there isn't sort of an heir apparent or the right person, or sometimes a family uh, business has had a key employee involved in such a meaningful way that after years or experiences, it really makes sense to have that person involved. Um, and I think it's important for that person to be around as early in the transition or even sort of pre-transition as possible um, for the family members to all get to know that person, for that person to be able to demonstrate to them that he or she has respect for the business and for them as individuals. And really um, for everyone to understand from family meetings from the get-go that this person is there to help foster and promote the business of the family, and they are to be embraced, not chastised for the same. Yeah, excellent response. Well, we only have two minutes left, um, so I really want to thank both of you for being on this webinar today. Uh, I also want to thank Thomas and HB for supporting and being the sponsor of Family Enterprise USA. As Thomas mentioned, he did come to D.C., uh, he worked really hard. He not ever participated in all our meetings. He did a lot of Hill meetings. It was a great experience for all of us. And we once again, really appreciate that. Uh, and so Thomas, before I sign off, do you have any uh, final comments you'd like to make? Well, I just uh, would like to, first of all, thank Abby. You did a great job. Uh, your kids are beautiful, by the way. Uh, <laughs> so, so thank you very much for, for sharing all your wisdom with the with the attendees today. And um, as I said at the beginning, uh, just really proud of the work that Family Enterprise USA does to support family businesses. And we're just proud to be a part of it and look forward to continue to support it and uh, advocate on your behalf um, in Congress. So but Pat, thank you for your partnership and for getting us involved in this great organization. Well, thank you, Thomas. We really appreciate it. And thank you, Abby. I agree, it was an excellent, excellent presentation. And thank you all for joining us on the webinar today. We really appreciate your time. And um, until next time, we're signing off. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.